angle, first of all, we should say that this is a true Mycenaean innovation. This is something that we see for the first time, most probably worldwide. Uh, so in that sense, we are looking at something that's very innovative, very new. The Mycenaean engineers took the corbelled arch one step further. They applied the idea to create a revolutionary interior space called a corbelled dome. The dome was used in only one kind of construction, a tomb. Like the Egyptians, the Mycenaeans built incredible structures to house their leaders in the afterlife. These tombs are called tholos. Their construction departed from anything the Mycenaean engineers had ever done before. I mean, the circular form is completely absent in the architectural minds of the Mycenaeans. The Mycenaeans work with straight lines and, and right angles. So the circle is just for this kind of structure. So that makes the impression and the symbolism of the circle as related to death even stronger. Building a tholos was a giant engineering feat. The first step would have been to hollow out the side of a hill. So they dug this trench, and this trench would form the dromos, which means in Greek road or way. In this case, it's a walkway to the tomb, and it's flanked on each side by these beautiful almond stones set in lengthwise and edgewise. Now, 3,200 years ago in 1200 BC, a visitor approaching would walk down this dromos, and then he would be confronted by an unbelievably magnificent and stunning sight, this massive doorway. The doorway would be flanked by two fantastic columns carved out of solid green marble with zigzag and spiral designs going all the way up. Each one of these massive stones is two and a half feet tall, and there are 33 rings of these stones laid out in a conical shape. Now, each layer of stone is laid over the lower one in a sort of protruding fashion. That's what we mean by the core build style. And then they're shaved down to make it all very smooth. In order for this structure to be stable, you need a constant pressure from outwards, inwards. Very much like a barrel, where you need this band, this metallic band around to keep the rings together. This pressure comes from the addition of earth. As they build, they add earth from around and quite a lot of earth and there comes a point when they have finished the beehive structure inside at the same time they have built a whole earthen mound on top around 1100 bc this early greek civilization suddenly and mysteriously disintegrated and disappeared there's lots of theories about that. I think the most dominant one is new tribes, new barbarian tribes came from uh, the steppes and they attacked uh, the civilizations of Egypt, they attacked the civilization of Mesopotamia, causing disruption in the trade routes. But that became their fall. With the fall of Mycenae, Greece entered a dark age. Over four centuries, its culture fell into a deep slumber. Then, in the eighth century BC, individual city-states began to develop and flourish, each one forging its own identity, competing for economic, military, and engineering prominence. One Greek island in particular, Samos, would see the construction of one of the most amazing engineering feats seen in the ancient world, moving mountains to bring water to the people. The ancient Greeks believed that Homer, the 8th century poet who wrote the Iliad and Odyssey, was actually blind. Sparta, Athens, Corinth, Thebes. These are just a few of the more than 100 city-states that emerged all around Greece 400 years after the disappearance of the Mycenaean civilization. Before the advent of democracy in Greece, Many of these city-states were led by a single ruler called a tyrant in ancient Greek. Around 540 BC, a tyrant named Polycrates came to rule over the island city-state of Samos in the eastern Aegean Sea. 
he was quite a player on the international scene. He made a tactical alliances, not just with the Persians, but also, for example, with the Egyptians. He was an ambitious figure. Polycrates saw that the path to power for an island like Samos lay through the sea. He built a fleet of 100 triremes, terrorizing neighboring city-states and taxing ships that passed through the surrounding waters. Under Polycrates, uh, Samos, his home island, became the dominant sea power, and that was the basis of his wealth and power. With his newly found riches, Polycrates built up defensive walls around his capital city and set about to solve a problem that plagued many cities in the arid Mediterranean climate, drinking water. Samos was a very, very important and powerful city. They were needing a lot of water, and they were short of water. There was a plentiful spring available, but it was separated from the city by the 900-foot-high Mount Castro. Somehow, Polycrates and his engineers had to figure out how to connect the city and the spring. Running an aqueduct around the mountain was not an option. You could construct a water supply system around the mountain, but the first thing a besieging enemy would do to cut off that water line, and uh, there you are with your wonderful uh, fortification, with your wonderful new walls, and you're drying out. The solution required thinking outside the box. Polycrates turned to an engineer named Eupolinos. Eupolinos came up with a solution that literally meant moving a mountain, a tunnel running straight through Mount Castro. It would be a huge project and a lengthy one. The time needed for such tunneling should be enormous. Therefore, the decision was taken to drive tunnels from both sides. This is a mathematical and a technical problem. Like the engineers of the modern-day channel under the English Channel, Eupolinos dug tunnels from each side of the mountain until they met in the middle. To succeed, Eupolinos would have to be sure that each tunnel started at the same vertical height on opposite sides of the mountain. The tunnels also had to match up on a horizontal plane, otherwise they would pass each other like ships in the night. Without sophisticated surveying equipment, it was a remarkable challenge for an engineer to take on. One theory involves a short walk around a large mountain. By forging a path from the spring to the city in short perpendicular lines, Eupolinos could measure each small length in order to calculate two sides of a right triangle. With two known sides of the triangle, the hypotenuse became the path of the tunnel through the mountain. What made this prodigious feat of engineering even more amazing is that it involved not one tunnel, but two. The main tunnel was dug at a height and length of about six feet by six feet, but was only used as a workspace to dig a second tunnel, adjacent and below the main one. That would serve as the actual aqueduct. While the work tunnel was dug on a straight plane, the aqueduct tunnel was dug along the side and below. This second tunnel needed to be angled on a slight gradient to allow the water to flow gently downward toward the city. It was a matter of life and death in the dark and dangerous bowels of the mountain. Once they were in the mountains, the difficulties must have been paramount because rock may be moving in unpredictable ways. Water may all of a sudden splash up and cause havoc. This was uh, probably a constant danger. Apart from that, it was dark and needed to be illuminated, and you needed to constantly know where you are in order to keep your line straight. After slight adjustments, the two crews met in the middle almost exactly where Eupolinos had originally determined. The floors of each tunnel connected with only 24 inches difference between them a discrepancy of less than one-eighth of a percent of the tunnel's 3,500-foot length. This stunning engineering achievement may have been the shining moment of Polycrates' reign, but his political fortunes would not prove so bright. The Persian governor on the coast of uh, Asia Minor decided that that degree of autonomy that Polycrates enjoyed was unsuitable 
to the development of Persian power, and he was arrested um, and uh, brutally tortured and crucified. Polycrates was just one tyrant among many who ruled the city-states of ancient Greece between 800 BC and 500 BC. The rule of the few over the many was the only form of government humans had ever known, but that was about to change. The city-state of Athens was going to change the course of world history. The visionary leader who would make it happen was named Pericles. His legacy would be an everlasting monument on the Athenian Acropolis that rose above the clouds. An amazing piece of precision engineering called the Parthenon. The word encyclopedia comes from two Greek words meaning a circle of learning. In 480 BC, when Themistocles defeated the Persians at the Battle of Salamis, he saved not only Athens, but also its young democracy, which had been born about 25 years earlier. For Athens, the age of the single ruler was over. Athens was rich in military might, treasure, technology, and ideas. She was poised for her golden age, and one man would take her there. His name was Pericles, a democrat and enlightened intellectual who encouraged the arts. But Pericles would also expand Athenian power through any means, including threats, bribery, and naked force. Pericles came from one of the old aristocratic families of Athens, so he came from the kind of family background in which a career of political and military leadership was expected. His rise to power began when he was elected as a young man to the position of Strategos, one of 10 such men who commanded the army and set foreign policy. A natural at politics and a gifted orator, Pericles was soon Athens' most influential and powerful statesman. Pericles was the typical political animal, if you like. This guy was a politician. He uh, was able to speak and convince. He was completely dedicated to what he did. Pericles became leader of Athens in 461 BC. Thanks to the fleet of triremes Themistocles had built, the Athenian navy held unrivaled power in the eastern Mediterranean. But despite the defeat of the Persian Empire at Salamis, the threat of another invasion was always looming. In 478 BC, Athens, together with the city-states of the Aegean, formed a mutual defense alliance called the Delian League, the ancient world's version of NATO. By 450 BC, Athens has become the undisputed leader of the Delian League, which is nothing more than a money faucet for the city-state. But Pericles, as undisputed leader of Athens, finds ways to put this money to the best possible use by building massive public structures that best reflect the grandeur and magnificence of Athens. Now, legend has it that Poseidon, god of the sea, and Athena, goddess of wisdom, each came to the Acropolis to compete for the patronage of the city, the outcome to be decided by the inhabitants. Poseidon struck the ground with his trident, and up popped a spring. Athena struck the ground with her spear, and up came an olive tree, which not only suggested sustenance for the Greeks, but a possible outlet for a commercial venue. Thus, Athena became the patron goddess of the city. Over the centuries, there were several temples to Athena, most of them destroyed. But we leave it to Pericles to give the world the 